This conversation. Yeah, sometimes you go in with like a pre-assumed idea of what someone's going to say or how they're going to act. And then the reality plays out completely differently. And it's so different to what you had in mind. Well, it's just kind of awesome. And that was what happened here in this conversation with Martin Ball. Martin is a scholar, an educator, and the author of multiple books on the subject of psychedelics, as well as a series of fiction. He's a well-known speaker on the psychedelic scene, and he's been boots on the ground talking publicly about these substances and their benefits since the early 2000s at many big name events. In addition to all that, he's a musician, podcast host, probably a zillion other things. But the thing I would say he's most well known for is his work with 5-MeO DMT and his experience with non-duality, which is why I wanted to talk to him. You know, I've often been seen as someone who is critical of the, the God experience, which is associated with non-duality. Non-duality meaning one, like everything is one and one could say is God. Now I have zero problem with that label and I've used it myself in my videos along with other terms such as oneness, the universal consciousness, the face of creation, or whatever poetic language I come up with to describe that ineffable fundamental thing that you experience within these deep psychedelic states. You know, so if someone wants to call that God, I'm fine with it and I totally get it. In the non-dual world, because all is God, then everything is God. You, me, my daughter's hamster, YouTube. This is all just an expression of the universe of God. And yeah, okay, I'm fine with that. And like I've said many times, personally, I don't really care what the explanation is behind all this psychedelic weirdness. The problem I have around the God label comes with the extra bits that sometimes get bolted on by some of the more eccentric people within the psychedelic community. And this typically involves paranormal woo-woo or spooky bullshit. So does this mean that the non-dual experience always leads to this kind of delusional thinking? I mean, do I even fully understand what non-duality is? I mean, I thought I did based on my experiences, but you know, I wasn't having these thoughts that everything is imaginary and felt that I'm manifesting reality like some guys talk about. So with all this in mind, I thought the best thing to do would be to speak to someone who's an expert in this non-dual space. And that's what brought me to Martin Ball. Martin is, in my opinion, the daddy of non-duality in the psychedelic discourse. And so I figured if anyone could answer my questions, then he was the man for the job. And honestly, I thought we were gonna disagree on pretty much everything. But the reality is that there is very little daylight between us. And this is what I mean when I talked about my preconceptions, because as I discovered here, Martin is incredibly grounded and very friendly and can explain his position extremely clearly within a couple of minutes. And on top of that, he was just an awesome dude. So don't be put off by the terminology of God because this conversation is personally certified by me as being bullshit free. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. So without further ado, I bring you Martin Ball. Thanks for having me on, Rob. Yeah. No, no, thank, thank you, mate, for making the time. It's a, it's a, a pleasure to talk to you. So I, I think I always think a good place to start is if just you could just like briefly introduce yourself and just a very, very quick summary of your work, just in your, in your own words, um, just for my audience. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Martin, like you said, and um, I've been involved sort of in the quote unquote psychedelic renaissance uh, for quite some time, kind of going back to 2006 with the publication of my book, Mushroom Wisdom. Um, but uh, also back in 2008, I started my own podcast, the Entheogenic Evolution Podcast. And, you know, at the time, there was only like a small handful of, of podcasts about psychedelics that existed in the world. Um, now, you know, they're everywhere. There's, there's hundreds of different podcasts. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of early on um, in the whole modern psychedelic renaissance. And I've published a, a number of books since then. Um, I'm kind of really best known for my work with 5-MeO DMT, mm -hmm. um, but I've also published books about Salvia Divinorum. I already mentioned Mushroom Wisdom. I'm also a novelist. I've written six novels, um, all of which are psychedelic novels, in including, you know, the ingestion of psychedelics within the novels themselves. And um, 
I'm someone who underwent really a, a rather profound process of awakening and transformation, which was largely facilitated by 5-MeO-DMT and also augmented by ayahuasca and salvia divinorum. And that was back in 2008 and 2009. And pretty much ever since then, I have promoted what I call a radical non-dual approach to psychedelics and psychedelic experience. And also have called that the entheological paradigm, which is basically a worldview that I have developed out of my own experiences. So it's a, it's a non-dual perspective, but it doesn't come out of any non-dual traditions such as Buddhism, mm. Hinduism, or Taoism, or, um, you know, it's something that I developed on my own. So there's some differences there. And, um, Boy, also, I organized the Exploring Psychedelics Conference here in Ashland, Oregon for five years. It was uh, the only conference about psychedelics uh, north of San Francisco in the United States for a number of years. And now, again, this is another area where now there's a lot more conferences taking place. Um, so I've kind of been a pioneer in this area. And I'm also a musician and an artist. And uh, I also practiced as an underground psychedelic therapist for seven years, working with 5-MeO-DMT. These days, I just offer consultations for mm -hmm. people. So I don't actively do medicine sessions with people. And I call it non-dual and theogenic integration, helping people understand what's going on in their psychedelic experiences from a non-dual perspective. And uh, also, yeah, still active, giving talks and interviews, you know, throughout coronavirus, been doing like online conferences and, and things like that. And uh, you keep yeah. busy, mate. It's good. Yeah, got, got your fingers in a few pies there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, just just out of interest, how, what's that been like for yourself then? Because you have sort of, like I mentioned, you are a bit of a pioneer here and you have been there through the sort of the early days. And as we've seen sort of, you know, what's been referred to as a psychedelic renaissance explode. And we've, we've seen technology kind of explode with it, which, is, you know, enables things like this. So sort of what, what's, what's your sort of take there? Is it, are we are we in a sort of like a, a better place at the moment? Or is, is there all like sort of almost too much information out there that's becoming noise? Or what, what's your take? Oh, I think that uh, we're much better informed now than mm -hmm. when I started doing all of this. And actually, you know, when I, when my book Mushroom Wisdom came out in 2006. Um, everything that I've done except for that book has been self-published, but that was published by a publisher. And in 2006, she was saying like, yeah, well, people aren't really writing about psychedelics anymore. So we don't know if there's going to be much of a market for this. And actually it's only increased since then. So, you know, there had been sort of a dying off of interest in psychedelics and popular culture and scientifically speaking and medically speaking and all of that. But I think it's just exploded since then. And now we see university departments putting together departments of psychedelic studies and mm -hmm. psychedelic medicine and psychedelic therapy training programs. Here in Oregon, just this year, we just um, passed the ballot initiative to legalize psilocybin-based therapy in Oregon, which is just revolutionary. We also yeah. decriminalized all drugs. Um, and then also, you know, when I started my podcast and, you know, in particular talking about 5-MeO-DMT, almost no one had ever heard of it. And something that was quite controversial at the time that I was getting on my podcast and saying, everybody is excited about DMT, but DMT is basically the kiddie pool compared to 5-MeO-DMT. <laughs> and it really pissed a lot of people off that people didn't like that because they hadn't heard of it. They didn't know what the difference was. Mm -hmm. And also, I was one of these people who first really started talking about non-duality within a psychedelic context. And there was also a lot of pushback against that. But now, 5-MeO-DMT um, is something that is now known around the world. And people actually use the phrases that I first introduced, that I first started calling it the God molecule and the crown jewel of entheogens. And I now see that around the world, people call it that. And people are having conversations about non-duality and psychedelics all around the world. Um, and we have far more scientific studies and papers that are being done, and it's much more acceptable in a university context. And even, you know, my area, my PhD is in religious studies. And when I was a graduate student in religious studies at University of California, Santa Barbara, back in the late 90s, um, I think psychedelics maybe came up twice 
in right. different classes that I had, which is absurd because you can talk about virtually any religion, and particularly the more you get into history, that psychedelics, you know, cannabis, mushrooms, all of these things have been involved in religions for thousands and thousands of years. And there's much more widespread knowledge and also documentation about all of this. And so it's changing in academic settings. It's changing within culture itself. Um, so I think that basically, I think the wave is broken, that we're, you know, it was kind of a trickle of change, but I think now change yeah. is going to be coming much more rapidly. And I think that we're much better positioned for it. And I think that we're in a time and a place where we need it more than ever, um, you know, living through uh, dictatorships and autocrats and wannabe dictators and coronavirus and anti-science and, you know, just all the craziness that we've been living through. That yeah, I, this, I think this the is definitely is a strange time. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. bizarre. But, but yeah, I mean, I think like, uh, along with everything that you just said, that kind of that acceptance has kind of shifted as well. Which I, think, I think people are now more receptive to hearing this, whereas before it was, you know, when I was a kid, it was always, you know, take psychedelics and throw yourself off a building. And, and now there's this kind of a much more academic discussion. So, yeah, there's, there's something in the wind there. Um, but yeah, and I just want to sort of like, the reason I wanted to get in touch uh, was really around the, the non-dual aspect of, of, of what you do. Yeah. Um, so I'll just give you a little, a little bit of background on myself. Um, so I, I read your book, uh, Entheogenic Liberation. And I've sort of experienced most of the sort of the main psychedelics like you talked about, so uh, DMT, 5-MeO, ayahuasca, psilocybin, various others. And so I've had similar experiences as, as what you described in, in your books. So hopefully we've got like a kind of a, a common foundation for this conversation, even if some of the conclusions we might not necessarily agree on. Yeah. And uh, the reason I kind of I wanted to broach this topic is I did a video about, it was about nine months ago, and uh, where I was kind of critical of some ideas put out there by another psychonaut who was, again, very in this kind of non-dual camp. And But specifically, it was because it was because of some of these conclusions that they came to as a result of the non-duality, of the, you know, non-duality equals this. And it was specifically going into stuff like sort of paranormal abilities and, you know, unlock sort of psychic powers and things like that, which I am not particularly interested in. I was a yeah. bit dis dismissive of. So... But like when when I put that video out, the, the pushback I got was that people thought I was dismissing the entire idea of non-duality, where I, I wasn't, I was just kind of dismissing these particular conclusions. But I do sort of definitely have like a few questions around the outcomes of the kind of non-dual mindset, and I'd like to sort of get into that later. But I, you know, I just want to say from the day, I absolutely do acknowledge that there is an experience there to be had. And that is yeah. you know, something that can be you know, immensely valuable. And I figure if I'm going to talk to someone and sort of challenge my own ideas on this, then, yeah, I figured I may as well talk to the person who literally wrote the book. So, so here we are. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to do so. So I think, yeah, I'd, I'd like to start off with just talking through some of the stuff that you raise in the book, um, sure. uh, Entheogenic Liberation. And I, I just wanted to say, first off, I do really enjoy the, the bluntness of the book because you very much <laughs> sort of tell it like it is. Which is something that kind of us from like from the north of England, we're sort of very known for talking very bluntly. So it was very refreshing to see it it sort of spelled out so cleanly. But I can imagine that's I think well, as you just mentioned, it's not something that everyone takes easily. I mean, what what was the overall reception like when you when you put out that book? Well, with Entheogenic Liberation, um, it's it's honestly it's it's been my best selling book ever since I put it out, and mm -hmm. it really I think it's considered like the 5-MEO DMT handbook or, or manual. And it comes out of, you know, seven years of experience of serving people 5-MEO DMT. So it's not like it's a speculative work for mm -hmm. me. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty certain about the things that I assert. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't put a lot of fluff in there. I just you know, like, this is the way it is. Um, I would say that, um, when I first started sort of on this trajectory, the book that I wrote was Being Human. And that was back in 2009. And that I definitely received a lot of pushback from. And a lot of people were very reactive where basically there was, there was two sets. There was one set of people who would read it and say, oh my God, this guy's onto something. 
mm. I think I think this might be it. And then the other side was just like, who the fuck does this guy think he <laughs> is? <laughs> what I mean, I I I literally got you know messages from people saying that like like this I, the one that stands out. This guy said like, I read the book. And I loved it so much that I gave it to my girlfriend and she got so mad. She threw the book across the room at me. I was like, yeah, that kind of sums up how people have taken my work. But see, by the time of writing in theogenic liberation, which came out in 2017, you know, I, I have not backed down. I have kind of taken my position and I've mm-hmm. made it very public. I've done it on my podcast and on my talks. And so you know, I think I think people kind of know where I'm coming from. So I haven't really. If if there are people critical of entheogenic liberation, they haven't felt compelled to let me know. Whereas when I wrote Being Human, man, they definitely felt compelled to let me know what they thought if they were. And what was it? What was it? Was it just the audacity of of like of you speaking out, or what or was there a specific like thing yeah, they they had in, issue with? Yeah, in part, it is just the audacity of just me writing this short book that basically says, look, this is the nature of reality. I'm going to tell you what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, And that, you know, I have my PhD in religious studies. I've studied a lot of religions and I am not religious. I characterize myself as non-religious and non-spiritual. And that's been a big part of the psychedelic renaissance has been um, the spiritualizing of psychedelics and the ritualized use of psychedelics. And I think that there's a place for that. But ultimately, I think that it's limited, that I think just following an ayahuasca tradition is limited. I think that um, making rituals is limited and that I think that the fullness of what it means to be a human being is actually to transcend and go beyond that. And that was actually the theme of um, my novel Beyond Azara that I wrote in 2014 is, you know, it's a fantasy science fiction book, but it's all about going beyond the doctrines, going beyond the beliefs mm-hmm. um, of any particular community. And, you know, a basic distinction that I make between my view of the, the non-dual and theological paradigm is I, I say it's not the shamanic worldview. And that's the shamanic worldview is that, you know, there are entities and spirits and other realms and that you can contact this stuff. And I have very strongly come out and said, no, these are all projections of the self that are mm-hmm. operating at an egoic level and that you can actually go beyond that. And so, you know, people who are invested in those traditions, they're offended by that in the same way that if you tell someone that their religion is illusory and delusional, you know, it, beliefs that are more closely tied to someone's sense of self-identity, they're going to hold on to those more and they're going to be more offended and more triggered by someone challenging those beliefs. And they're also gonna be more resistant to counterfactual information that presents them with an alternative view. And so, yeah, I've certainly encountered a lot of that. And I've been quite brash and brazen and very authoritative in you know, my presentation. And so I don't leave, I don't leave a lot of gray area in how I discuss things. And, you know, that's also a cultural tendency of, a, oh, well, let's respect everybody's view and everybody's perspective has value and all sides are equal and no one really knows. And, and it's just like, I don't buy into that. And I did. It's important to note that I did buy mm-hmm. into that. But in going through this process myself, I came out the other end with kind of this, oh, shit. I think my view is actually quite different from that. And if I'm going to be true to myself, I need to express that. And that, yeah, I definitely trigger people. I set people off. And, you know, I don't, I don't read reviews on Amazon, um, <laughs> but certainly people tell me, that they, they, they tell me that the reviews are either, oh my God, this is the best book ever, or just what a piece of garbage this is terrible you know so people I mean, that, that's, I, that's the world we live in it's, it's the bad everything that happens sucks or it's awesome there's no middle ground yeah. anymore to anything <laughs> yeah everything is so polarized yeah it's terrible but, but how do you how do you sort of reconcile that then because i mean i i, I think if i think one thing we, I mean, we we can sort of agree on is that the this psychedelic experience it it it, it is very hard to say this is like absolute fact to it i mean there is a fact that we are having the experience but you know because 
then the, there's the potential there for someone who's had a religious experience. You know, they can say, well, my thing's just as valid as yours or someone who says, you know, the absolute militant atheist who will say, well, absolutely, there's nothing. And I know that because textbook said so. And so, I mean, it, it, the, there must be a sort of a point where you can sort of acknowledge that, OK, well, you know, these clearly this is, you know, you are wholeheartedly believe this, what, what you are saying. But it, it, I th is it not a bit of a stretch to say it like it, it's it's a fun, it's like a provable fact across everything or? Well, that's where the non-dual experience itself is really the, the, the center point. That's that's mm -hmm. the key to all of this. Um, so one well, of I, the... Well, I'll tell you what, just, just before you saw, you saw the goal sure. there, just, again, just for the benefit of the audience, can we like just define it? What, what do we mean by non-duality? Because it, it's, it's a word that gets thrown around a lot. And, you know, I think sometimes it gets like misapplied along, you know, stuff like ego death and stuff like that. So, um, and, and I realize when yeah. we've talked about the non-dual experience, the words completely start falling over, but just, to, yeah, just for the benefit of the audience, what, what do we, do you mean when we, when we talk about non-duality? Yeah. So the non-dual experience is the experience of the complete transcendence of subject object duality. And so that's why it's called non-duality because everything that we ever experience aside from the non-dual experience is a dualistic experience mm -hmm. there is a sense of self there is a sense of other there's a sense of this is me there's a sense of that is not me there is a subject there is an object to it and that the non-dual experience is the transcendence of that meaning that there is no longer a divide between subject and object there no longer is a divide between what you think of as yourself and what you think of as not yourself and more importantly it's an experience right that it's not an idea it's not a concept it's not something that you can either believe or not believe in it's an experience that you have mm -hmm. and that experience itself puts your dualistic experiences into perspective. So uh, kind of an analogy that I like to use is when we're dreaming, we're in a dream space and it's, it's really funny because most of the time in a dream space, all the normal laws of physics seem to apply, right? Mm -hmm. If there's gravity, you know, we're walking through an environment, there's objects, um, and you know things can get weird in dreams but in the dream for the most part we just we believe the reality of what we're experiencing and then you know when we wake up later we say oh that was a dream but at the time mm -hmm. we thought it was real but also within a dream there's a potential for a lucid dream where you become aware in the dream that you're dreaming and at that point you know you wake up within the matrix, quote unquote, where when you know you're dreaming, it's like, oh, this is a dream. So the normal laws of physics don't apply. I can fly around if mm -hmm. I want. To. For example, I can breathe underwater if I have to, or if I, if I want to. So that we become aware that actually we were enmeshed in what we thought was a reality. But then we get a perspective that where we're kind of looking outside of it and realizing, okay, this is actually a construct. This is a product of my mind. This is not really happening. So I can bend the rules and I can do other things here within this. And so the non-dual experience is kind of like that for reality as a whole, that you go beyond your normal dualistic experiences. And keeping in mind that I also classify like 99 percent of all psychedelic experiences still reside within the realm of a dualistic and then from the sure. non-dual perspective you you can then recognize like oh these things that i thought were separate and real actually were products of my own mind that they were products of consciousness that i was perceiving and interacting with in that space but actually they don't exist independently of me that they're a construct of me at one level yeah, I mean, um, this is why I mentioned that it gets it gets thrown around a lot because I I completely agree with everything you said there, and there are you know there are categories of a psychedelic experience. I think there are some which are just purely psychedelic, or some which take on this kind of like sci-fi storyline, you know, narrative yeah. to it, and and then there's you know ones going through sort of mystical experiences, and then I think like the full sort of non-dual experiences where I, I've. So I mean, I, I found that the non-dual words, along with a few others, get thrown around very, very liberally, and everyone's 
so every, everyone's had ego deaths and everyone's had non-dual experiences and i i think it's it's actually it's 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 a subset of the landscape of psychedelic experience and i think are, are you, i mean you there's a phrase in your book which i absolutely loved uh, when you were talking about 5-MeO DMT is the way to get there which is the uh, the trip to mean molecular express which i thought was just an <laughs> an awesome way of kind of reliably getting to this this uh, non-dual state but I just wanted to kind of pick your brains a little bit about what the what the boots on the ground sort of situation in regards to non-duality is in terms of like what does it mean for our existence as human beings? Because there's a couple of bits you just mentioned that I just want to try and unpack. So first off, you mentioned that it, this is an experience. To, to, this is something to be yeah. experienced. So in that case, you know, a kind of crap analogy might be it's like it's kind of skydiving. You know, you. You skydive, you had the experience of skydive. Once you've had it, you cannot un-skydive. Un it's done. Yeah. Um, but then, again, the, the analogy then the other that gets used is that of, of sort of waking up. And people tend to use this as it's, it is a transition of a permanent transition of state sense. So you you wake up into sort of an, an, and then you are aware of, of non-duality. So is, is this something whereby, I, like, once you've... And again, a lot, a lot of these questions I'm being sort of devil's advocacy just to sort of try and uh, pass out your, your stance here. So sure. is, it, is, it, is it something where you, you know, are, are you woken up into this no permanent non-dual state or is this only happening, the non-duality is only happening within the boundaries of the psychedelic experience? Yeah. Um, so I describe it generally as it's a temporary phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that... Um, it's something that you get access to and then you're there for a, a period of time in a sense well you're not there because you are gone <laughs> and it's and it's just see that's the thing is that it, it just is that when the ego mm. fully gets out of the way that's it's just what it is um but within the psychedelic experience it's always a temporary phenomenon so with 5-meo dmt um it has the potential to start within a number of seconds, right? You take a hit of 5-MeO, and if someone is able to fully let go of their ego, then it just starts happening. Mm -hmm. And then in some cases, the ego comes back within a number of seconds. Mm -hmm. And then in other cases, the ego is transcended um, for maybe up to 15 to 20 minutes. And then the energy of 5-MeO starts to die down and then the ego comes back online. And then the person says, oh, I woke up, I regained consciousness, I came back to, I came back into my body, I came back into reality. Um, so it's, it's a temporary suspension of the ego. And that for me, the value of it is that first of all, it informs you of what who and what you are at your truest and deepest nature. And here the language that I use is, guess what, everybody? You're God. Mm -hmm. And by that, I am not speaking religiously. I'm not talking from any religious tradition. By God, I mean that there is, in reality, there is actually only one consciousness. There is one being. There is one consciousness that is made of the infinite energy of unconditional love. And that it is all of reality. That that, that being is reality itself. Mm -hmm. And that from the human perspective, we are two different versions of this one being interacting with and experiencing itself from two different perspectives simultaneously. And that, that that's just what reality is. And that it's not it's not an achievement to have a non-dual experience. It's just, it's a falling away of the constructed identity and of our normalized perspective as an individuated expression of this universal consciousness. And so in that sense, it's verifiable. It's not verifiable from outside, but each person can have this experience where, so again, going back to what is my definition of the non-dual experience, the full non-dual experience is not, I was with God, or I felt I was part of the infinite. The full non-dual experience is a recognition of, holy yeah. shit, that's me. I am reality. I am God. And that's not the ego talking. That is just the self-identification talking, the self-awareness talking. And so it's a temporary experience. And no, 
no one's enlightened from their <laughs> private EO DMP experience. Yes. That you don't, you don't, it's not like, it's not, what, what I like to say is like, look, it's magical. It's amazing, but it's not magic. You can't just smoke 5-MeO-DMT. And then after that, it's like, boom, I'm enlightened and liberated. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't work that way. Because enlightenment and liberation is a process of unwinding yourself from the constructs of your ego, which doesn't mean living without an ego. It actually means living with your ego in a healthy way way that is grounded in clarity and grounded grounded in reality versus an ego that has not gone through this process is confused mm -hmm. and is attached to its beliefs and its projections and its habits and its you know unconscious modes of operation so as a process i mean that's why the subtitle to entheogenic liberation is unraveling the enigma of non-duality meaning that it's something that takes time to unravel like what the, what the fuck does this really mean and what's the value of all this and then with 5-MeO DMT energetic therapy and I I use the word therapy because you know therapy is not a one off thing right mm -hmm. therapy means it's an ongoing process of deeper and deeper learning and deeper and deeper actualizing actualizing of yourself uh, in your true authentic form and so for me, the, the upshot of all of this is not so that you can just go live in oneness all the time and just mm, everything's perfect. It's so awesome. You know, that's not the point. The point is actually learning how to be the individual that you are in a way that is free from the ways that you have limited yourself, the ways that you have edited yourself and censored yourself and judged yourself. And then that also applies to how you're dealing with yourself at the exterior level of other people, of objects, of reality itself. So it's a way to live in clarity so that you can simply just be the person that you are without the continual editing and self-criticism and doubt and judgment that just plagues humanity, especially the modern Western mind is just plagued by this shit and tell me about it man you don't, you don't have to convince me <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so five of the dmt i say it's a tool to help this process along and it's it's an exemplary tool but it's just a tool so smoking five meo dmt and then people say oh i'm enlightened now well that usually wears off after the next 15 minutes and then then their ego fully comes back and they're like oh no, I'm just back to being me, but I really felt enlightened a few minutes ago. You know, this, this is a common response that people have. So that's why I say it's, it's about learning to work with it because that, look, people have got all kinds of repressed energy stuck in their bodies. And that's because their ego has blocked them from expressing themselves genuinely for mm -hmm. social reasons, religious reasons, political reasons, whatever. People are constructs of themselves. They're not really authentic that, um, you know, the way that I describe it is that, look, the ego is just a character that God is playing through your body, through my body. But without the non-dual experience, we identify fully with the character and we think, oh, I am that character. So we are limited by that character. But when, when you really enter into the non-dual, then you realize, oh, I actually am this infinite being that is everyone and everything in all places and all times which is then channeled through the character that I'm playing. So I'm, I am both infinite and I'm also the character that I'm playing. So how do I play the character in a way that is most in alignment with what is authentic and true and real? And that for me is what liberation is. It's not about floating off to cloud nine. It's not about being high all the time. It's not about, you know, just, what we also see a lot of is just this spiritual bypassing of people say, well, I experienced that actually everything is perfect. So it means everything is perfect, including all the troubles that I have in my life and all the things that I dislike, that those are perfect too. So I just have to be happy and nice all the time. And I have to love everyone, even when they do terrible, nasty things to me. And that's just a form of spiritual bypassing. That's, that's a way that beliefs get in the way of, you know, actually being present with reality. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of sort of toxic sort of positivity of this yes. sort of, you know, 
But yeah, everything is is awesome, and nothing can be challenged. And you just if you got any sort of criticism of anything, then you're just an asshole. And I think yeah. that that it ties in as well with something which which sort of is one of my bugbears is um, this kind of element of of like drive through spirituality, whereby you know someone does do something, whether it's you know sort of like you know an ayahuasca retreat or the, or five AMO experience, and then that's it done and they are enlightened and stuff like that and i wanted to sort of sort of one of the points i wanted to try and unpack with you because the i i, I don't disagree with your your sort of your definition of, of of sort of god and how that sort of or the even the use of the word god in terms of this non-dual experience but it does then feed into this kind of problem that i've just mentioned whereby because somebody you can have one of these experiences and these experiences are just so gobsmackingly awesome that, yeah, I mean, it, it does just knock most people on their ass. And then the the languages, the, the terminologies there around around God. And and I think it's easy to see where that ego inflation can come from, because um, particularly you know, if you if there are people with, you know, it's, it's, it's a weird sort of paradigm because the people who are after ego death, are usually the ones who need their ego strengthening because their ego is so kind of so weak that they just start accepting crazy bullshit. So it, I, I think I, pr I probably know, you, you know, your answer here because, you, know, you know, the, the God word is just like the right word. There's no other word for it. It is, it is God. That's that. But it, it, do you see, you know, is, is there a problem there in, the, in that it does feed into this kind of it, it can very easily end up as something ugly I think and so if you had any thoughts around that yeah well that again that kind of really points back to the idea that I really like to emphasize the process that it's not mm -hmm. about a one-off experience and that the ego can definitely co-opt the experience and it I mean, there are just so many ways that it can happen, you know? So one of the things that can happen is that when you experience that you're God, that then you come back in your ego and your ego says, yeah, that's right. And it's me. And so I'm the authority and it's me. But see, it's like, no, 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 no. Your ego is just a character that God is playing. Okay. So it, yes, it's you, but it's, it's not your ego. And, um, then, yeah, some people, they actually do need their ego strengthened again, because it's about living with a healthy ego. Mm. And it's, it's kind of like accepting that you're incredibly special, but everybody's incredibly special so that actually then you're not incredibly special. And so that there's this kind of inequality of the elitism of it. And, and so it's very ironic that way that it's, it's like, oh, I am that. And that can make the ego feel really special. But then you always have to remember, and so is everyone else. Everybody else is, is also that. Um, yeah, it should be a and, humbling experience, I think, because I, I, th I think it's you, uh, the way I tend to think of it is that you, you are realizing that the, the universe is special and that you have this kind of place within the universe. And so, you know, and everything shares this kind of same status. And it's you know the, the and the vastness of it is just you know magnificent yeah. <laughs> <laughs> magnificent and it, it's uh, and, yeah and it's vastness and it's and so it, there is this simultaneous feeling of humility balanced with sort of um i don't know like sort of responsibility and sort of again knowing your place but there is this, this very definite balance and I, th I think that a lot of people for that it, it goes completely out and they just they just become ab absorbed by that experience and absorbed by the sort of the, um, the, the the sort of the terminology and I think like what you said when the ego comes back it, it does grab its claws into that and, and just doesn't want to let yeah. go of it and doesn't and doesn't want to get back to the thing of actually no you you are a human being and you are going to have to go and take a shit in the next twenty four hours yeah. so it's you know <laughs> yeah you know, think... dialing down a bit dude. <laughs> Yeah, I think fortunately, in a lot of cases, that wears off, you know, that that can be kind of the first few days or even the first few months after a 5-MEO experience. But then eventually, you know, 
all the unconscious habits of the ego reassert themselves and then people find themselves back down in the same shit. And then, and then the ego adds another layer and then starts criticizing themselves for like, Oh, you fell back down. You were in this exalted state. And now, now look at your back and now you're bad and you can't do it. You've done it wrong. And then another aspect of this, that's terribly ironic, which I definitely encounter a lot in the consultations that I do with people is that having a non-dual experience and even when it's really humbling, as you say, that then people can also, ironically, after having this experience of being, oh, wow, I'm actually everyone and everything, that then they ironically feel more isolated than ever in their lives because mm -hmm. suddenly they've had this experience that when they talk to other people, other people's egos are like, oh, you can't, well, you can't say that, that you were God or that you experienced God or, you know, people don't understand them and that, you know, it, it's the phrase that gets used is this ontological shock that kind of you get the rug ripped out from underneath you. Like for me personally, my first five MEO, my first full five MEO DMT experience, keeping in mind that I had had a couple experiences prior that were not the full deal. But when I mm -hmm. got the full deal, it was just within seconds, you know, I would, I was a self-described atheist. Okay. And within seconds, it's like, oh my God, it's God. <laughs> what? Oh my God. And then, and then I was just so overcome with gratitude. I was just, just for like 45 minutes. I was just, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it was a shock. I mean, it was, yeah, I've been, I've been there. I, I, had, I had a similar thing and I was like, okay. Yeah. Yesterday I was this, like, what, what do I do with that? No, <laughs> it's a, uh, because, yeah, because you, you cannot, sometimes you cannot unbelieve stuff. I mean, I mean, there's just no mechanism. You can't, like say, if you get thrown out of an airplane, you cannot unexperience the skydive. It's, it's fucking yeah. happening. Get, get over it, dude. So, yeah. yeah. I sort of, and, and there was a great, I, I just want to say, there was a, a great bit I, I, I liked in your book where you was recommending against couples doing this as some sort of like relation, you know, something to yeah. boost the relationship because it can just, sort of drastically knock you out of sync with each other. And uh, I, it's something I've strongly sort of recommended for. It's like, yeah, if you think plan on doing, you know, probably more psychedelic things, this is not a group activity. You know, it's, it's not a, it's not a relay couples activity. I don't think it's a, you know, it's because one of you can end up having the time of the life and the other one can end up in some introspective nightmare, which just doesn't, doesn't gel well as part of a couple yeah. of well, sorry i cut you off there what, what, what are you gonna say mate? yeah no, it's, it's quite all right yeah definitely results vary and that and that's another thing that that i thought from my first five my first full five meo dmt experience i mean it was just it was the pure full non-dual experience it was infinite consciousness infinite love i mean it was just i i now like to use the term of like that was an experience of grace mm -hmm. that it was just grace and i thought at the time i thought oh you give people enough 5-MeO-DMT and this is what happens. But then I learned really quickly, no, that's not the case at all. Because there's so many different ways that the ego can hold on or resist or fight. And that some people are ready to let go all the way. And then other people have a lot of unwinding and they have a lot of self-hate or self-loathing or fear that they have to confront within themselves before they can release all the way. And then a lot of people who get a really big, open, beautiful experience of grace the first time, then the next time, all the shit of their ego shows up. And then and then it gets much, much harder for them. And mm -hmm. then they have a lot of unwinding that they have to do. And so again, it's sort of emphasizing the process and that it not, I always tell people also that you know, this is true of psychedelics in general, but more so of 5-MeO because it has this potential to really take you all the way. Mm -hmm. That don't take it if you're not prepared for the fact that it might really fundamentally change your life. Not because you're going to come out and suddenly, oh, I'm enlightened, but that you start to become aware of where you're propping up your life for reasons that are not really authentic and true, but because it's safe or because you've been hiding or because you're afraid of something. And so that's why, but like, 
I say, well, look, it's not couples therapy because mm -hmm. actually a lot of people are, are in like codependent relationships. They're in unhealthy relationships. Um, maybe the relationship was over years ago, but they haven't admitted to themselves. And then they take 5-MU and it's kind of like the ultimate truth serum where suddenly they realize, oh, I actually don't want to be with this person anymore. Or, or it could be, I don't want to be in my job anymore. Mm -hmm. Or I'm not happy with the direction my life has been taking that I've been, you know, I don't want to be me anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't want to be me anymore. And then it can, it can even, again, ironically, it can increase self-loathing. See, that's why, again, you have to pay attention to the process that it gives you the opportunity to work on all of these things and potentially really transform these aspects of your life. But that takes work. That takes being a human being in the messiness. And it's not just, Oh, I need to check out again. Oh, I need to do that again so I can get out. It's actually more about, it's this process of uncovering deeper and deeper layers of where you've hidden the truth from yourself. And that can be extraordinarily uncomfortable. It can be really messy with lots of purging and screaming and yelling and crying and defecating and urinating and orgasms. And, you know, the list goes on and on. But it's, again, it's a process. And it's definitely, you know, for a lot of people with 5-MeO, they take it once and they say, damn, I don't think I ever need to do that again. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to work with it, actually, it, it's a process and it's, you don't, you don't get the full package of what the potential is with just one experience that it's because the ego is incredibly resilient, which is both a good and a bad thing. Mm -hmm that it holds on to its illusions really, really well. It holds on to its unconscious patternings really, really well. But it's also the features through which we have all normal social interaction. And we're social beings. We live in a social world. We don't want to all be isolated from each other. So our egos are necessary. They're good in that respect. But they do tend towards confusion. They do tend towards wanting to believe things that the ego is kind of a meaning addict it wants everything to mean everything and it wants it's an understanding addict it wants to understand everything and if it doesn't understand something then it'll make up a bunch of stuff and then pretend that that made up stuff is true so that it can understand what it wants to understand so the ego is problematic it's not inherently either good or bad it's it's just part of a human being and so learning how to live with that authentically again it's, it's a process for people. But if, yeah. when they work through that process, what they find is that then they're just more freely able to be themselves without the constant internal chatter and criticism. And it frees up their heart to be open, that people become more compassionate, people become more authentic, they become more present. And then they're less prone to adopting belief systems or you know, falling for bullshit or mythology and letting go of a lot of spiritual and religious ideas so that they can just be present with reality. And, and, and then it's like you get to see behind the mask that mostly people are, there's a mask in front of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like in my sessions with people with 5-MEO, for me, it was always like kind of this game, like I'm waiting for the masks to fall. And like, there it is. I just <laughs> saw you. You know, we're, we're, and then they're like, and yeah, then the ego comes back. Oh shit. He just saw me. He saw it. He saw me. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then nurturing that and encouraging that is like, actually you can be that all the time mm -hmm. and it can come through the mask of your ego. Cause I, I, another metaphor that I use is that the ego is like clothing. There's nothing wrong with clothing. Sometimes it's cold and you want to wear clothes and sometimes it's nice and warm and you want to take them off and that the ego is like that, but it becomes rigid and solidified for people and they can't, they can't see how could I be differently? You know, whenever people experience problems in their life, they usually experience the problem again and again and again and again in this format and then in that format and the same patterns repeat themselves and they get caught in these loops and they don't know how to get out. And so here, if you can just completely take yourself out of that context, and again, that would be the non-dual experience, then it helps put things in perspective and then see, you see where actually a lot of this has been my choice. I wasn't aware of it, but I chose to limit myself in this way. I chose to be this way. And so th this is a big part of what I talk about in being human, that really this is a process of learning how to take responsibility for yourself. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I was trying to think of it as kind of like a, a self-auditing sort of tool. It's a kind of yes. so, something that takes you out of yourself so that you can see yourself and you can see all these kind of stagnant patterns and the things which have just become petrified within yourself. And yeah, and it gives you that sort of kick up the ass. But I think the, where a lot of the sort of confusion comes from is that people sort of think that is the work, that that, that is the thing, you know, the, the the glass of ayahuasca, that's the work, or the shot, or you you smoke the 5 million, that's the work. And I, and I think that's what that really is, is the kick in the ass. And, and the kind of the work comes afterwards. You know, it's like if you're lost in the woods, then it's kind of, it, you know, it gives you, like I say, a kick up the ass, gives you, gives you a, a sort of a, a map and a flashlight, but you still got to do the work to find your way out, out yourself. So I think that's, that, that's where I see a lot of people getting this kind of, um, like I say, this, this spiritual inflation or this, or this drive through spirituality just because they sort of do it, don't necessarily fully process the experience, but they've done it, so they've ticked the box, and then yeah. it's like, kind of like, yeah, okay, yeah, feet up, I, I'm enlightened. Yeah. yeah, I had the Next. ceremony, I went through the ceremony, so now I'm done. And yeah, 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 yeah and it, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And but even within that, like within entheogenic liberation, you know, it's all written from the perspective of working with 5-MeO DMT, but I do lay out that actually there are energetic tools that you can apply to your work in the psychedelic experience that actually makes it more likely that you can process stuck energy and be less likely to be within the structures of your ego. So there's work to do in the psychedelic session, and then there's plenty of work to be done afterwards mm -hmm. itself. And that especially, I mean, this is where it just, for me, red flags go up. Whenever someone's like, oh, it was such a beautiful ceremony and I love the ceremony, the prayers and the songs. And that makes me, that makes me, you know, a better spiritual person. That's where I was like, no, you've really missed it. You've mm -hmm. really missed the mark. And that that is just more propping up of the ego. So I think that there's, there's preparation work that you can do. There's work you can do in the psychedelic session. And then there's also work that comes after that. And then there's work of going back into the psychedelic session again and doing more work. And then there's more work and there's more work. You know, for myself, I, I wrote my memoir, Being Infinite, to really lay out for people like this was my process. This is what I went through. Mm -hmm. And again, emphasizing it was a process. It wasn't just one event here or one event there. And what I found for myself that you know, during this time period in 2008 and 2009, which really started with my first full 5-MEO experience, that then I started going to the local Santa Daime Ayahuasca Church, and I was going two or three times a month and drinking ayahuasca, and then going back like once a month or so to the Temple of Awakening Divinity that was serving 5-MEO DMT. And then I was also doing work on my own, with Salvia Divinorum. And honestly, it was like going to graduate school in a sense where one experience built on the next, built on the next. And then also there was lots of breakthroughs that were happening without any psychedelics where my energetic state was changing in normal day-to-day -day reality. Mm -hmm. And then the line between tripping and not tripping, it just got blurrier and blurrier and then it just, it dissolved away. Um, but again, the key word is it was a process. It wasn't just one event or Especially, you know, when people think about, oh, well, I, I got this download and I got this insight and yeah, that's what I needed. And, and I, I, I'm always really skeptical of that kind of thing. It's like, look, like for me, the only real insight that's worthwhile is your God. And if you really get that, then it's about, OK, well, then how do I like actually actualize that in myself and actually be a full human being? You know, that I like to refer to humans as God toddlers. Um, and that I'd like godless, us to, mate. Godless, you should. You missed a trick there. Yeah, <laughs> I'd like us to be more adults with it, and um, yeah, that that the, the attachment to ritual and ceremony that for me it's it's just a big turnoff, and that because it's do you a think there's any, is is there any place there? Do you think? I, I mean, do you, do you sort of like totally dismiss the sort of the traditional thing, or is uh is it like you can? Do you, you know, go to the, say, like, you know, through the, the, the 5-MEO process to, to get that sort of non-dual experience. But is, I mean, is it something you could enjoy where, like, oh, wow, well, you know, that's just to enjoy, like, a beautiful, let's say, ayahuasca ceremony or something like that? Or is this is this just a kind of a relic now and that all the attention should be here? 
Well, I think that there's room for all of it, but I see ritual and ceremony as kind of a stepping stone that for a lot of people, what ritual and ceremony does is, you know, like if we were to compare it, you know, to like the 1960s when Westerners were kind of rediscovering psychedelics, that it was sort of a free for all. It was all done for hedonism and self-expression and people were taking acid, you know, uh, going to a Grateful Dead music show. And, you know, they had lots of positive experiences and people also had a lot of really negative experiences and yeah. difficult experiences. And so then there's been this emphasis on, um, not psychedelics, we want it to be entheogens. So we want to treat them sacredly. And that can, and even now, there's a lot of people in their 60s and 70s who were active in the hippie era, who took a lot of acid or mushrooms then. And now they're going to ayahuasca ceremonies and you know they're saying, oh, now I'm treating it as sacred medicine and it's really mm -hmm. shifted my experience. And so it's, kind, it's just a trick to get the ego to take it more seriously and to look at it as there's a potentially sacred result that I can get from this. And so the set and setting has shifted. And for some egos, um, cause you know, taking psychedelics is scary. It's unpredictable. You never know mm -hmm. what you're going to get. No matter how many times you've taken anything, it doesn't matter. Every time is fresh. Every time is potentially Oh shit, like this is the one. Oh, I've really done it now. <laughs> that that feeling is always there. And by ritualizing it and ceremonializing it, it gives people a sense of a context and a container. And there's also there's rules and behavior, you know, you you do this here, you don't do that. Um it's like a safety net aspect to it, isn't it? It's, it's like a, a safety yeah. sort of a, a the, the framework provides a kind of feeling of familiarity for, you know, and it, 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 you, you kind of feel like oh, it's it's not quite as out of control as what it might be because we're in, inside this kind of the, this, this bubble of the ceremony sort of thing. So I think I think we describe it as a stepping stone is very appropriate because it's we like most of us in the West, we come from probably the atheistic background that you and I sort of both have, or at least a very low belief background. Yeah. And then to get from there to like, holy shit like you know what is going on with existence then i think that's i think that ritual element it, it does sort of like i said allow people to get from there to there because some people can no, no don't go from there to there but i think for most people it's that that gradual slide uh and through through ritual i think i think it does have a purpose yeah yeah, that, you know, the, when it came to me, like actually serving 5-MEO to people, that by that point, I was like, look, I'm just totally done with ritual and ceremony and all of that, that I just, for me personally, to engage in any of that would be inauthentic. It would be like, oh, I'm, I'm doing this to make the person feel comfortable or to convince mm -hmm. them of something. And it's just like, I just stopped doing that. Like, I'm, I'm not going to do that. That's you know, just as you say, in writing the book, I'm just really straightforward. I'm really blunt. It was like, boom, this is it. Okay. So, you know, I tell people, okay, you're here. We're going to take five MEO, DMT, you're God. Okay. I'm going to help you with that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and we're not doing any ritual. Um, but some people that it helps them feel safe, but other people, it's important to note that some people are really turned off by it. And so then it actually shuts them down some and so this is also something that I encounter a lot in my consultations with people where they say, well, I went to this ayahuasca retreat center and then they made me put something up on an altar and they made me read a prayer and I just wasn't into it. And so yeah. then there, for some people, they play along because they don't want to offend the facilitators or they don't want to offend the other participants, but then it becomes an inauthentic experience for them. So it's not necessarily helpful. And also in a lot of these contexts, the facilitators aren't maybe even themselves really experienced with the non-dual experience. And then when it happens to someone, so th this is another thing that comes up a lot of times with people in my consultations, that they've been to an ayahuasca center, but they had a non-dual experience. And that then their facilitators and the other people who were present, they don't know how to help that person process it because right. they're actually unfamiliar with that territory. And they say, oh, well, let's say some prayers or, you know, let's, let's smudge you with sage or let's, you know, shove some hape up your nose, you know, 
and that they're they're not really equipped to deal with someone who actually has gone all the way into this experience because it you know ayahuasca is beautiful and powerful i love ayahuasca it's great um but it's it's not 5-MeO-DMT, and, and it's not, in most instances, 99% of the time, it doesn't give people access to a full non-dual experience. So then in the rare instance where it does happen, in a ceremonial context or in a shamanic ritual context, people don't know what to, to do with it, and that they end up feeling isolated within that. Mm-hmm. So, so th- th- there's a place for it. I think it's a good introduction. But also, you know, like in entheogenic liberation, I say, well, if you really are going to live as a liberated person, eventually you're probably going to let go of your spiritual or religious beliefs in those communities because you see that actually a lot of it is a game of projection by the ego and that the more liberated you become, the less you want to play illusion games. Like games are still fun. Because mm-hmm. we are an intelligent, sensitive, creative beings, and we like playing games. But when it starts, when you start to become aware of the smell of bullshit, it becomes more and more adverse. And you're like, oh, 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 I just, I, I just don't even want to be a part of this because there's, there's too much illusion taking place. At least that was my experience. Yeah. And so I, you know, I use myself as the model again. I'm not coming from any particular tradition or school of thought. I'm just. I'm just coming from my own experience, you know, like I, I went to the ayahuasca church for like a year and a quarter. And on the last time that I went, it was just so clear that I was done with it. I mean, I just knew I'm never coming back. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm done. This, this served me, but this usefulness is done at this point. It, is that where like a lot of the kind of pushback sort of came from? Was it from the people who kind of really hold on to that sort of traditional view and just, again, didn't like your sort of rejection of it? Well, to to some degree, yes. But also, I mean, this is kind of what I'm referring to here, is that I was going through a process when I was participating in the Santo Daime Church. Mm -hmm. And no one there understood what that process was. Because they have a lot of beliefs and spirits and entities and things like that. And so people kept asking me, like, well, what spirits are you working with? And I would tell them, like, well, it's just me and God. And they're like, whoa. They're like, they didn't know what to make of that. And I was going through all this energetic reconditioning, which from the outside perspective, they thought maybe I was possessed. I mean, I even had a guy like trying to do an exorcism on me once. I was standing <laughs> out in the forest. I was standing out in the forest on a stump. Like you're not supposed to leave the space, but I just I couldn't stay in there. So I was standing on a stump outside in the forest. My hands were up and vibrating, and I'm throat singing because I'm just embodying this energy coming through me. And this guy comes up with sage and he starts saging me and he's saying all these prayers. And inside, I mean, I'm just laughing because it's like, dude, you have no idea what's going on with me. But anyway, after I left, and that was in 2009 that I left. And then I wrote my book, Being Infinite, my memoir in 2014. At that point, so, so... I I had kind of a buddy where we were, you know, in the Santo Daime Church, they stand you, they place you often by height. And so right. there was a, a much older gentleman who's around the same height as me. And so we were almost always standing together in the back. So we were kind of like Daime buddies um, where you're not really supposed to interact with other people at a Santo Daime work, but we were kind of Daime buddies. And then I sort of disappeared from the church And that he ended up reading my memoir after I wrote it in 2014. And then he ended up coming in doing several 5-MEO sessions Mm -hmm. with me. And and after his first session with me, he said, you know, I have something to confess to you. I was like, oh, okay. And he said, you know, none of us understood you at the Santo Jaime Church. And we just, we all thought that you were really, really weird. (laughs) And now I've read your memoir and now I've just had this experience with you. And he's like, I get it. I get it. And, and he, and just, I'm, I'm so sorry that I ever thought that you were strange or that I didn't understand you or that you were confused. Cause I see now that actually you were going through something that none of us were prepared to understand. 
and you know wow oh awesome awesome so well, i mean i mean there's, there's a, a couple of sort of things i just wanted to sort of get a, a just run through a sort of a, a kind of checklist because like i mentioned at the beginning that there are some sort of extrapolations from this this non-dual thing into some more sort of extreme beliefs so Okay, I'll just put these to you, and I'm, I'm just trying to sort out what your stance here to sort of separate out the sure. baggage from like non dualities that have accumulated. So, so I mean, I, I, from what you said, I think I know your your answer to this. But so you do think that that, that sort of this is there, there is a physical plane of existence then that that we are occupying at this moment. Yeah, one hundred one hundred percent. Yeah. Okay, and and would you say is this physical plane is this existing? As you know, as part of the, this kind of, of, of the universe, as part of the, the what you might call is God, but whatever it is, there is it, all of it. There's a, there's a physical, there's a conscious, there's there's the divine, whatever you want to call it, but it's it's all here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's not like the, the, the other kind of what I'm getting at here is that no one person is manifesting existence like like you you are not a figment of my imagination that, that i'm i'm just manifesting you know to talk to me or, or no, you? no 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 that i definitely am not uh solipsistic in, mm -hmm. in that sense and also i do not take the position that you quote unquote create your own reality or that you manifest your own reality um honestly my take on that is like thank god um, <laughs> I mean, it would be such a mess if actually if each one of us could just manifest our own reality that I mean, because we're so again, we're just God toddlers. And that would just be a, a total disaster if if reality actually worked that way. Um, the only thing as individuals that we really have any kind of choice or power over is our reactions and choices. And, and that's really about it. But we are we are. Okay, so I call God is the all being and the all being is playing all the characters simultaneously. So we're all really here. Mm -hmm. Like your body is different from my body. You are not a projection of my mind. And, you know, because th this happens a lot with people on 5MEO DMT where they think like, oh, shit. I'm dissolving and all I'm going to take all of reality with me. And like, thank goodness it doesn't work that way. No, that was just <laughs> you and your perspective. Um, there is no one of us. See, because every little bit of reality is God busy being that bit of reality mm -hmm. and that God cannot violate itself. So even though the glass of water is me, this is also God being a glass of water all on its own, independently of my perspective of it. So there's nothing I can do about that. I could drink it if I want. I could throw it at somebody if I want. I could water the plants with it if I want. But I can't just like, mm, I will dissolve this reality or, you know. No, you know, it just we live in a regular physical system with all the rules and regulations that go with that so that we can have a coherent energetic structure through which biological life can evolve. And so, yeah, the, the phys physical world is the physical world. I, you know, it's an illusion in the sense that we participate in subject object duality and that most of the time I don't experience the glass of water as actually being myself. But because I've had enough non-dual experiences, I know that it actually is, but I still get to experience it as a separate object. So it is kind of an illusion, but it's not just an illusion. And that's, that's a big one that sets me off when people yeah. say, oh, reality is just an illusion. My answer is, yeah, but it's still reality. Yeah, it might it might be an illusion, but it's still reality. Yeah, and I think the people get sort of very caught up in the sort of in the sort of the illusion simulation kind of words because yeah, I mean it, yeah. It, everything I'm seeing now is a simulation. My brain is clearly simulating something, but that it's not quite the the simulation that you that you think it is sort of thing. It's it's still here. Yeah, there is, there is a refrigerator. There is a, a table. There is there is a me. I mean, I, I, do you do you sort of take that any any further, or do you have any kind of opinions on this, this the kind of the concepts around you know we are the universe experiencing itself kind of thing? Like, is is there a do you have any like is there a purpose to us, or or is it just that we we are here and that's just, that's just that? 
Yeah. Well, when people say we are the universe experiencing itself, that's generally people who are afraid of using the language of we are God experiencing itself. But yeah, so the universe is God. God is the universe. They, they, these these words are synonymous, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we are God experiencing itself. And actually, you know, my my feeling is that at the heart of it, it is because God is the infinite energy of unconditional love, but as the only thing that exists, that love is actually self-referential. So mm -hmm. it's a form of self-love. And the thing about love is that it actually desires an object that it can direct its love toward. Mm -hmm. And so that the manifestation and the evolution of the physical universe is the act of God loving itself so that then it could eventually, over billions and billions of years, evolve itself into sentient life forms that can interact with itself, and then also love itself as love another, another being. And you know, one of these catchphrases that I have is that everything's better when you can share it with somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you find when you find new music that you like, it's like, oh, I want to share this with someone. Or you, a new television show, you know, the first thing is, you know, I text my friend, oh, man, have you got this new show on Netflix? Like, this is great. You know, everything you love, you want to share because that it, op because love is open. Love mm -hmm. is sharing. And that this is God's sharing of itself so that it can share with itself. And that, you know, I think that's the ultimate purpose of existence is not just so that God can experience itself but so that God can love itself through all these myriad forms. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful way of putting it. Mate. I've always kind of leaned towards the, this idea of that, you know, it's what, what we are, we are here to be a human being. And I think this kind of, it, it also it kind of conflicts a little bit with the people who I think go a bit off the rails on the psychedelic path, who just want to spend all their entire time in the transcendent and just sort of, again get, get sort of lost in the thing of I, I can do this i am manifesting reality and, and i'm kind of i'm always trying to ground it in well wh whatever it is going on you know before i was born or when i die it is this is i'm having a human experience and i want to have the best human experience i can and if i spend my life you know just sniffing my own farts and dribbling at the wall about how you know how transcendent i am then i'm, I'm kind of i'm not doing doing my job of 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 having this human experience i'm not i'm not taking advantage of what was what was given to me so yeah i, I always sort of try and that's what i used to kind of ground things back to me is like what what can i do with this experience these these things How, what what can i get out of the out of the non-dual experience or, or any psychedelic experience yeah. and if yeah. it's just if it's just sitting there you know like i say ignoring my kids while i while i sit there and bask in my own like in, in my own reflection of, of godliness then it's kind of i don't think it's served a purpose then it's it's got to it's got to enhance uh, this life somehow yeah yeah that's why i always go back to saying look the whole purpose of all of this is just learning how to be yourself authentically mm -hmm. as the human being that you are and you know i always say that look you were god as a human being before you realized you were God as a human being. And then afterwards, you're still just a human being. So this doesn't come with any magical powers or psychic abilities, or I'm just gonna, you know, I'm gonna float off into the universe. It's like all of that. This is the only thing that wants that is the ego, right? And this is not about inflating the ego. This is not about turning you into some super spiritual, magical person who, you know, has all these amazing abilities that I say, look, all of your abilities as God, as a human being, you've had them your whole life. You've just been mistaken in where you've put your full attention onto your identity. But that, that's what shifts. That's what changes. Um, but like back when I was doing sessions with people, um, because I'm very good at being in the energy of the experience. Because again, that's about being authentic, about being present with what yeah. actually is. I can't tell you, like so many of my clients afterwards, they would ask me, like, so you're psychic, right? That you have psychic abilities. Because they, they, they literally thought I was reading their minds. When actually I'm just feeling their energy and yeah. just looking at what's presenting itself. And then I know what's going on. But from their perspective, it's like, I must be psychic or something like that. And I always tell them, it's like, 
psychism isn't real. I, I've never met a genuine psychic. I am not psychic. I'm not a mind reader. I don't have any of these abilities that you think I have. I'm just being present with what's happening. That's that's all. And and even another area that's kind of funny is, you know, because I give a lot of talks and a lot of interviews and a lot of presentations and people are familiar with my face and they're familiar with my voice. Um, something that I get on a fairly regular basis is messages from people saying, you instructed me in my dreams last night, or you were in my psychedelic Holy experience <laughs> co coaching me along. And they, they want to know how it was for me. And I tell them, it's like, look, that is just your internalized representation of Martin, that that was not, it's not, I was not involved in that, you know, but see, see, going back to what we were talking about earlier, this is a place where if my ego wanted to jump on board, it could be like, yeah, oh, oh that's yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> I, yes, I am showing up in your dreams and visions and I am instructing you. Yes. Uh, very good. Please come sit at my feet and I will teach you my wisdom. But I always tell people, like, no, that's just you. That's it's not me. But it's it, not it's me not, personally. Isn't that tragic though? I mean, that that, I mean, what you what you just described that you know you you sit there, you guide through someone through one of these experiences, and then you, what you're really doing, you're just acting like a, you know, a present human being, and yeah. that that is so otherworldly that you have to jump to this conclusion, like, wow, you 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 are psychic, you're married. It's like, no, I'm I've just I'm. I, we're just connecting. This is this is just yeah, just yeah. Fantasy one hundred and one, and yeah, that's it's that's what's kind of like it's 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 actually mind blowingly sad, you know, that that we we can be so disconnected that we have to jump jump to yeah. these kind of like crazy crazy yeah. <laughs> conclusions. Actually, that that makes makes me think of another example. This was um, pretty close to when I stopped doing sessions. That a woman came. And she was from the Santo Daime Church, not the local one, but uh, she had come from California. And she came to do a session with me. And again, in Santo Daime, they uh, put a lot of emphasis on working with spirits, working with entities, being a channel, being a medium. So yeah. that's their framework. Yeah. And so I did this session with this woman. And she, when she kind of reintegrated at the end, she's like, I have never seen such presence and and she asked she said what being are you working with <laughs> and then and i just kind of sat there and she looked at me and all of a sudden you could just see the realiza realization on her face she's like it's you and so like, she, she's recognizing the sort of the god in within you is with it's like looking back at her yeah, well, she realized that I'm not channeling anything. Mm -hmm. I was just being myself and that I am that and that she is that. And I mean, just the recognition, she was just like, oh, my God, it's you. Like, you're just being you and you because you've opened yourself up to the infinite being that you are, that you're just you're that right here. And it's not some separate being. It's not some entity that I'm just being present. Isn't that just so much more rewarding, though, than the kind of this? I guess this is kind of like blows my mind a little bit with the, the kind of like the, like the woo woo and and the, and the bullshit. It's like the, the very simple truth, is fucking amazing. <laughs> like like it just doesn't require this kind of, this this stacks of bullshit. Like is, is it like the experience in itself is just so fucking mind blowing that yeah I just. I, I, I just, I, it, it, like I say, it just blows my mind that, that people just need to start convoluting it and, and, and twisting to think of things. It's very, very simple. And it's, it's, it's yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear yeah. you say that it's, uh, uh, that's, that's your perspective on it. So well, I, it, it really shows how addicted to meaning making the ego is. That, mm -hmm. that, that the, the, tr the truth is so simple that the ego says, it can't be that simple. I've got to make it more complicated than that. But the fact that it is so simple is just mind blowing. And then the ego says, oh, well, I've got to create structures and meaning and symbols and edifices and mythologies. And, uh, you know, I've, I've got to create all this stuff because I can't handle that. It's just actually so simple. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I see time's marching on a bit better, so I won't keep you for too much longer, but I just wanted to, to ask you one last thing. 
Given, I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about the kind of 5-MEO tonight, but I, I hear you sort of talked about, a, you know, all the other um, cyclics. Where do you think it is a good place for someone to jump in here then? Do you, do you think, is, is it, is, should someone go from sort of zero to the non-dual experience or is there a kind of a, 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 a stepping scale here of, of a path that you would advise somebody down? Or is it just jumping at the deep end, tie rocks to your feet, <laughs> jump in? Well, you know, really, the, the honest answer is that it varies, mm. you know, that because each person has their own history, has their own identity, has their own construct of the ego. And some people are ready to jump all the way into the deep end and, uh, and other people aren't. And so, I mean, it, it's a really, ultimately, it's an intimate question, like, like, Actually, I have to email this guy back that somebody just messaged me on Facebook the other day. And he's like, I have OCD and anxiety and depression. Would 5-MEO fix me? Or should I do ayahuasca or take mushrooms? And my response to him is like, we actually need to have an in-depth conversation before I can answer that question for mm -hmm. you. So, so, th so that's like, that's the real answer is that really it depends on the person. But I will also say that in my time serving 5-MEO, um, I had people who had zero psychedelic experience whatsoever who did great. And then I also had lots of people who had done years of work with ayahuasca and you know, mushrooms and you know, DMT, and they had a really difficult time. So, you know, it really does vary. And for some people going all the way into 5-MEO, it seems to be a beautiful introduction for them. And other people working up to it might be more beneficial. And particularly people, I think someone who's kind of healthy and grounded, 5-MEO is okay. Mm -hmm. Someone who has a lot of mental or emotional disturbance within them, you know, maybe working with something a little bit you know, milder would be better. And for some people, um, you know, in my consultations that I tell them, I want to see you go actually work with a therapist, you know, go see a therapist and maybe a psychedelic therapist, but also someone you can talk to. Um, and then other people, it sounds like they're really comfortable going into a ceremonial setting. And then other people, like we talked about, that they're not comfortable with that. So you got to find the right environment that who you take it with is always very important. The environment you take it in is very important. Where you are in your life is very important. How within yourself or without of yourself you are, all of that is very important. And so, you know, it can work for some people to jump right into the deep end. What I don't recommend, if you are working with 5-MEO, like some people say, oh, I want to gradually work up to the big dose. And my take on that is this is a waste of time. Because you can't, you can't dip your toe in the ocean and then think, okay, now I have an idea of what it's like to be plunged into the deep end. That's not going to help you. So I do recommend if you're going to work with 5-MEO, go all the way. Yeah. But you might want to work up to that before you go all the way. I'm, I'm, I must admit, I am always a little bit jealous of sort of the people who do jump in with like zero experience and then jump in because – then you, you, you've not got that idea of what's in store for you. Maybe that's why some of the people who, who have had the years of sort of ayahuasca and stuff, why they do struggle with it, because you you, you think you've got a you think you've got this sus. You're just like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's in it's in the bag. I've got my ayahuasca badge. I'm I'm, I'm good. Yeah. And then you're like, yeah. oh, fuck me. <laughs> so so yeah, when you when you see like a total newbie jump in, like they've they don't have that kind of. Um, pre-built perception around themselves they, they just they just know they're going to get something incredible is going to happen and then it, and then it does whereas yeah i must admit, I'm, I'm always super anxious going into those going into those experiences just because it's yeah you know what's in store for you you're about to have your psyche sort of annihilated and it's uh yeah, yeah it's, it's it's not an, e an easy one to go into so i mean Matt, i'll i'll, uh, I'll let you get off there, mate. I just want to say thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed this talk, and I think I think you've explained everything uh, really beautifully. Um, what I'll do, I'll, I'll put some links in the description uh, below uh, on your website. Uh, but is there anything you want to sort of say, say in close? Anything you want to like point people towards, or any any sort of events you've got coming up? 
Uh, well, I will say, uh, looking ahead, that I'm completely revamping my 2011 book, um, In Theological Paradigm Essays on the DMT and 5-MeO DMT Experience and the Meaning of It All. Um, I'm completely reworking it. It's going to be about twice as long as it was. And so that's kind of my next project that I'm working on. And um, definitely, I would say for people who are listening to this and like, oh, I'd like to talk to that guy about my experience that, you know, I do offer 30, 60 and 90 minute consultation sessions. That would be non-dual and theogenic integration dot com. And that's the level that I work at these days. I, I definitely do still get a lot of requests to actually do a medicine session with people. And I don't but I do consult. So I'm always happy to talk to people. Um, so I just put that out there. Cool. Well, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your, your sort of transparency and the clearness of your, of your explanations. And uh, yeah, I'd, you know, I'd love to speak to you at some point in the future. It's, I've really enjoyed this conversation, mate. So thank you very, very Great. much. All right. Thanks, Rob. I really enjoyed it.